Saturday is wild and wacky with your favorite shows. Yo, okay. I couldn't be more excited. All new adventures Saturday. Wake, rattle, and roll. It's every Saturday morning. And now, three messages. Two. Good morning, I'm Adam. And I'm Dusty, and before we get started, Adam, mm. I'd just like to say that the arts of cartoon making, mm. while one of the most fundamental skills and perhaps the oldest skill on the planet, if you consider sequential art in its history, <laughs> I think I do. dating back, you know, com you know, comparatively to evolution, uh, I just wanted to say that it takes a superior individual to make these cartoons and that i am eternally thankful for their hard work that's that's true and having said that let's pick apart uh this crappy schedule of bad cartoons yes this is 1988 nbc i hope the golden girls are still around they're in the top tier on nbc right now with family ties cheers cosby show and a different world and my two dads mm. this was a big year for sequels we had police academy 5 <laughs> Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Oh, with that with George Clooney. Critters Two. Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. Yes. Very important film. Crocodile Dundee Two. Rambo Two. Short Circuit Two. Caddyshack Two. Poltergeist Three. Oh, Elm Street Four. And Halloween Four. Jamie's, Jamie's an, orphan. an orphan. Yeah. Do you notice like every one of those is where the series absolutely went fucking nuts? <laughs> <laughs> they what they overstretched. Yeah, every one of those they're like, we gotta do something different. This is the the MTV affected year. As far as cartoons go, this is a, a post Roger Rabbit world. So what? It's eight o'clock. I'm so depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I was depressed from that preview. <laughs> Uh, 8 a.m. is uh, the Gummy Bears. Is that right? Is that nope. You? No. You're one bear off. Oh, Kissy Bear? Yeah. Tra a train goes off the rails. Circus bears are released into the swamp. And this looks better than anything. This intro is animated better than anything you'll see. This was a series of, of dumb specials before it got to the year. They were like, all right, put it on Saturday morning. We'll buy the lot. <laughs> It it's sounds a, like a sounds like music from Hooterville. Fish out of the water to the max. They pitched this. What was the low end concept? You know, there's like two bears. They're city bears. <laughs> it's kissy fur. <laughs> it's kind of a baby show. Why don't oh we put them in the country? Oh my god! Did you watch this? Oh yeah, yeah. When I turned these on, I knew every freaking word to it. They lure you in with that fantastic looking bow, looking bow, intro. Bow, 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 you know, bow, how can bow, you pass bow. it up? <laughs> it's the story of the future, <laughs> isn't it? I guess you're right, <laughs> if you had a kid. Except they end up in the bayou. I think it suffers from the Marvel problem. It doesn't have good villains. The bad guys on Kissy Fur are two alligators who aren't Cajun like I thought, but they're just kind of southern and stupid. Mm -hmm. They kind of sound like old man Mc Old man McGucket! <coughs> One of them looks like Janis Joplin and is like always trying to straighten this like red wig. That's because he ain't Bobby McGee! <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I couldn't stop thinking, other than that the music on this show sounds like Heathcliff music, that the dad bear on this show sounds like Baloo, and he's doing like a Phil, he's doing a mad Phil Harris impression. <laughs> and here's where I, I, I'm like, ballsy. He's like, he calls Kissy for Little Bear. Yeah. That's so practically Little Britches. But you know what? I'm crazy, because I looked it up. He is Baloo. Ed Gilbert was Baloo on Tailspin. He passed away in 99, but he was also, get this, you'll love these two credits. He was Cat Scratch on SWAT Cats. Yes! Finally. And what can you tell <laughs> me about a character named Blitzwig from Transformers? Oh, oh that's amazing, man. <laughs> Did he sound like Phil Harris? You know, I never really thought about it. Little, little he's tires. A, he's all about, like, football. He's a tank and he's a train, but there's a famous episode where he takes over a football stadium. Wow. And he wow. Like, yeah, and he says, like, it's the long bomb, and he, like, shoots. It's the long head. bomb, little tires. That's amazing. He's a very prominent character. He's playing a real similar character to Baloo on Tailspin, who was kind of a delivery guy. He's a paddle cab driver, but instead of... 
what did Baloo wear in Tailspin? Sort of a fi- an aviator? A red and yellow shirt? Yeah, yeah. well, you oh, know. No, I'm sorry, that's... That's Gus, the uh, kissy for his dad. He wears a yellow member's oh, really? jacket and, like, a Dom DeLuise hat. Like a, yeah. And yeah. then Baloo kind of wore, like, an aviator's hat and sort of a jacket. Which he took off a dead man, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of this make I don't know where these animals get their clothes. <laughs> it's the rule of one article. Well, let's see what the Jellystone Handbook says about bare naked bears. Forest animals must not go naked. Each beast must wear at least one item of human attire. There it is in black and white. There's a blue female teacher named Miss Emmy, which is the only Emmy this show saw, (laughs) who looks exactly like Cindy Bear. And then there's Miss Golden Globes. This show is all about mommy issues and shithead pigs. (laughs) Which, Which episode did you watch? watch the pilot is it about the first day in the swamp or are they are they well established at this point no yeah they're not established you know it starts off kind of it's just like the show ozark with J- jason bateman <laughs> wow. except with bears <laughs> you know it resonated with me like i knew it all from my childhood <clears throat> It's all a bunch of little uh, moral plays involving Kissy Fur. Right. He goes down to play with somebody, and then they run across something. The dad's got to come save him. The episode I watched, Lady is a Chump. This is this is really far fetched. The alligators find a female bear costume in the swamp. So that's pretty serendipitous. And then as soon as Gus sees them, he's like, "You're my new nanny." Hello! So it's Mrs. It just, Doubtfire. That's what I wrote. I wrote this is Mrs. <laughs> Doubtbearer. I I did not have a fun time watching Kissy Fur. It kind of reminded me of the Get Along Gang, a collection of kid animals. It doesn't look bad. Kissy Fur looks dope, man. The art looks dope. For some reason, it's a, it's a above head and shoulders above a lot of these on this list. And maybe it's because of what you said about being in prime time. Uh, but the humor is, is huge for me, too. Uh, I'm just saying, as far as Kissy Fur goes, I was not the most disappointed. What's the availability of Kissy Fur? I, I, think I he, found it with not much problem. Yeah. I think most of the the Deke catalog, aside from Beanie and Cecil, is this the last season of Kissy Fur? It's only like two years, right? So this would be year two. You know what, Adam? I got conflicting information on this. Oh my god, no. <laughs> yeah, if somebody could let us know. Just type in Little Bear. <laughs> or No, no, no. Don't type in Little Bear unless that's what you're looking for. Let's guess. What, what, what do you think the finale to Kissy Fur was? Mom's not dead? Mom comes back from the dead. Mom? L- little wife. <laughs> You're emaciated. What <laughs> the hell happened? I had to eat the conductor. <laughs> They're bears. <laughs> oh man. Well, so that means it's it's eight thirty. Time to get really energetic. <laughs> you know, you never get this. You never get it this thought out. Part of their herstory. <laughs> that guy's interesting. The bad guy. This show's got a great bad guy. Bigglesworth. What's his name? <laughs> Biggles. No, it's uh, Duke Igthorn. Igthorn. That intro looks fantastic. We wrote it on a tree. Later that tree died. <laughs> all right, so this is season four of Gummy Bears. Were you already probably watching this show by season four? You think? Yes. Which, uh, which ones did you see? The uh, one was about them finding a ship. Oh, okay, an airship. Uh, no, it was the it was the um, are they trying to? It go was a to... submarine, and they called it the uh, gum gum siding or something. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, are they trying to get to New Gumbria? Oh, you know they are. <laughs> they were going through their history in this episode. It's kind of like Planet of the Apes because I, I didn't realize. Oh. The humans chase them underground. Oh, you're right. Yes, because they want their damn juice too much. They found out about them. They're like, "Cool." Well, they shook them immediately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> squeeze it. Drink his juice. What was the second? I hate gusto, man. Oh god, man. He ruins inspiration. It. This is perfect. They replace characters with gusto. Zummy barely appears in these two episodes. Oh, well, you know, Paul, I believe, is it Paul Winchell? Yeah, he was in Decline then, so they were probably oh. playing down Zummy, because he is kind of written out of the show for a while, but when he comes back, it's Jim Cumming. <laughs> well, everybody remember my disclaimer from the beginning of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but yes, okay, that, so that does explain it. So they had to bring gusto in. And I never, I never got enough of, of gusto and his 
What's his? his bur- he's got a toucan named Artie Deco. What a great name. Uh, this actually reminded me of Lost in Space. Well, they started out and they had a whole family. But then by season two, all it was was the robot and, and the kid and, the, and Dr. Smith. Right. You know? Same thing here with Tommy. And then the third most character was <laughs> Gruffy. You know? Okay, Gruffy's my favorite character on this show. Uh, in the first season, uh, Bill Scott of Bullwinkle fame is doing Gruffy. Uh, but then he's replaced. Oh, I like to see that. He's replaced by Corey Burton, who was Shockwave and oh, Sunstreaker. Oh, the, those names mean Shockwave's like yeah. t- <laughs> well, that's terrible. Shockwave, that was like Bob Dylan. Like, Megatron. In addition to that, which I knew you'd like, he was he was he's Lud- Ludwig von Drake, that very educational duck, and he's oh, he's the voice of the Dinks from Spaceballs. Dink, 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 dink. That's amazing. I watched the episode because I, I knew this, I remembered it, called Good Neighbor Gummy, where asshole Gruffy breaks his leg and then basically becomes uh, like xenophobic and is just like, get those people off our land. It's not the gummy way to share. He becomes Clint Eastwood and Grand Torino. <laughs> I can feel him going to that, you know? <laughs> so I thought I'd read... A couple of lines from Gran Turismo as Gruffy. <laughs> Ever notice how come you come across some gummy once in a while you shouldn't have fucked with? That's the gummy way. Ten gummy berries? Great gummy. Sonny, what are you, half ogre or something? You keep raising them prices all the time. <laughs> and, um... I'll bounce a hole in your face, then go underground and sleep like a baby. Get off of my Glen! Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me want to go stand in the yard. <laughs> the second episode I watched, this was so bizarre because this episode was animated. Like, the show's a really good looking show. Oh, Consistently, yeah. this episode was gorgeous, and I couldn't figure out why. Maybe they had specific teams that were better than others. It's rare you see anything this expressive pre Tiny Tunes. Uh, Saturday morning. Basically, Grammy Gummy's high school friend, a leprechaun named Nogum, drops in from under a rainbow. So Gruffy hates him because Grammy starts slacking. Y- you get a sense, like, was did Grammy have a relationship with a leprechaun? Speaking of the Blue Lagoon, which we were talking about earlier, they go <laughs> swimming and then they just kind of cut away. And the whole time I wonder, is she gonna fuck a leprechaun? <laughs> Oh my god. She's like, let's go away and just have adventures. And she's like, no, I'm old. Tell me you'll kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking Tina. This is a great June Foray role. Uh, she just decides she'd rather continue babying the rest of the gummy bears and do the dishes. <laughs> Luckily, they all pitch in and help her and let her just enjoy herself while she sits by the fire and sadly, then joyously humming the leprechaun's little tune. And then it becomes kind of happy. And she just stares at the fire, kind of like Grandma in the old Garfield Christmas episode. It's a real sad, sentimental, weird moment. I kept waiting for it to turn out to be the leprechauns, like, Oh, now that I'm here, disguised as your old friend. I was like, wow, that was just a weird little inner uh, moment for Grammy Gummy. That, that sounds like it needs to be on a Gizmodo moments in kids' cartoons that were more sentimental than we realized. Top. Like, am I watching Gracie Frankie? <laughs> Is this Beaches? Deep relationship. I want to pose a question to you. Okay. Just see if you agree with the statement, okay? Mm. I think that the ogres... Okie dokie dookie. ...are superior to Toad Wart. Oh, but, but, but my dookums. He's, he's riffing the whole damn time. I'm so thankful, you know, for them. <laughs> like, because Toad Wart talks constantly, and then, like, they got a shot. I like, tend to go on. Guys. He's the star screen. Life's a bitch, then you ogre. I don't know. He got on my nerves. I, I think... <laughs> I think just by that time, that character just right. worn too thin. But the right. villain looks great. He looks yeah. like something out yes. of uh, Dragon's Lair. I love his weird blue-gray thing. You rarely see him out of it, so I don't know what his hair kind of looks like. Yeah, it covers his head like it's armor. It's bizarre. He's like the you know villain that's not old. Really, the only way to differentiate Gummy Bear seasons other than Gusto is by who's playing Cavan, the boy who knows about the gummy bears and looks like Wart from uh, Sword in the Stone. This season he was voiced by Jason Marsden who played Max in the Goofy movie. I totally recommend this show. It's pretty available. You know, I I recommend this show not this season. By the time you get here, some of the jokes are wearing a little thin. Okay. I was I'm not as big on Gusto as Adam, so. But it is nice to include a gay gummy bear. 
All right, it's <laughs> nine o'clock. <laughs> that means it's time for oh my god! From the home of all things tender. So this this season of the Smurfs is season eight. We've accumulated. Wild Smurf, the Smurflings, Scruple, and Grandpa at this point. Who, do, who, who does the voice of Nanny Smurf? Susan Blue, again, from the mom from Friday the 13th. Part Are you seven. serious? <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch uh, the introductory episode to Nanny Smurf, the, the Lost Smurf? Yes. <laughs> She's like uh, the Fox Show grandma. She's just like, I want to get laid at Lollapalooza. The problem is, is that... I, I, I just want to hear more Jonathan Winters, and uh, I know she takes up Jonathan Winters' time. She's not as funny. Here's the explanation for Nanny's origin. I'll explain later. Smurfatuti. Oh my God. Um, oh, oh, oh. Nanny Smurf, Grandpa's counterpart, is trapped in a living castle with big arms that forces intruders to do chores for food, which I guess it poops out. <laughs> She makes a little God's Eye kite, and Wild Smurf brings it to Grandpa, who's kind of a more reckless Papa Smurf with Jonathan Winter's voice. Yep. She sucks. She's kind of like the rapping granny from The Wedding Singer. She's like, oh, hey, Grampers! She also has a pet named Smoogle. <coughs> who, oh. who um, says the word Smoogle, has a talent for sound effects, and looks like a red version of that Lost in Space monkey. Oh, yeah. Not he, Matthew uh, Blank, the yellow creature. <laughs> Smoogle's a nightmare. Smoogle! 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 He'll haunt your dreams. He's but like, does he say Smoogle enough? I don't think so. I hate him. <laughs> uh, I can't stand him. I don't, I don't want to sound like a grouch, Adam, but I can't stand Wild <laughs> Smurf. Smurf. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry. You Wild don't like Wild Smurf either? No. His gibberish. His gibberish talk. So this episode, they had to rescue her from this Saw meets Beauty and the Beast type castle. And the episode ends like a Caddyshack party with them just going any way you want, Smurf. Woohoo! I want to do the nasty. We're losing kids. It's season eight of this seminal series. Who do we bring in? Nanny Smurf. She's twice as old as Grandpa. You're an executive at the time. How do you go to him and you're like, all right, you know who I want to opposite Jonathan Winters? You know what? The excitement over Grandpa will not subside so let's add more old people here's an interest and interesting thing about grandpa <laughs> is that grandpa returned like a couple seasons ago after being gone for like 500 years because he's papa smurf's papa smurf so this season we get to like flesh out rather than nanny smurf for some reason we flesh out grandpa's nemesis whose name is nemesis ace and this is how he was described online a sinister hiccuping creature shrouded in a purple robe who is an evil wizard like Gargamel, but more powerful. And he accidentally put himself under an ugly spell, <laughs> which only Clockwork Smurf is unaffected by because everybody else just wretches. It's Nemesis is just a different version of Gargamel, just like Grandpa yeah. is a different version of Papa Smurf, right? He's just older. He is after the Smurfs' long life stone, this stone that makes... That is correlated to Smurf. Like years. Correlated to Smurf magic. Uh, it's kind of like a fifth element deal. Only it's the fifth one, and you need four other elements to kind of keep uh, Smurfs going. So he's always after that to live forever, which is why Grandpa lived so long. Hmm. Clockwork Smurf uh, is struck by lightning and turns fiery. Sounds like the plot to Powder <laughs> or uh, Back to the Future. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's another episode where Gargamel does voodoo on greedy. Yes. Any show with a satanic ritual in it. So he would eat himself to <laughs> death. Oh, uh, man. Uh, so what, what, I was bored finding out things it's like, I yeah. always wanted to know. Adam, were they having a writer's strike? Because they <laughs> seem to have... They replaced all the regular characters with characters that speak gibberish. <laughs> I'm Smurf Tootie. I'm Tom Bomba Smurf. <laughs> all right, it's, it's 10 o'clock. It's time to watch Alf. Gordon's in the outer space. How would you describe this world already? It's kind of 60s looking. You know, they said on the live action series that it was supposed to be made out of Melmac. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is the stuff they so make. The ground? It's okay. like plastic. They're kind of, their flying cars kind of look uh, like the neutrinos from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. See, I loved this this theme song, but I never really would watch the, so, the show. So I totally missed the end theme, which you brought up. It's a We Are the World parody. Bring us into outer space. This is so good. They all come out because, of course, they were all characters on a show. 
That is so high concept. The hell? So this is just the ALF half of the ALF hour. The season two, the ALF prequel, where it's Melmac. It's kind of like Tasmania. Like, oh, ALF had a whole family of people that were pretty stock. (laughs) And his name's Gordon. And he wears a Hawaiian shirt, even though Hawaii doesn't exist on that planet. Yeah, there's a bunch of space jokes. How would you describe the humor on ALF? It mostly revolves around ALF getting around to his tagline, ha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th- now, keep in mind, Adam, uh, we're talking about ALF right this second. Because mm. there's a there's a mm. distinction between this and ALF tales. So the humor comes from the ordinary scenarios with surreal settings so this is like mad libs the tv show several times i was like what the fuck am i watching they eat cats but also there's an abundance of mayo which is obtained through mining they live in some sort of birdhouse. It looks like the follow that bird. Oh yeah, fill me Dodo. In. Fill me in because I, I mostly watched Alf Tales. Dodo. Oh good. <laughs> they live in kind of a birdhouse in East Velcro. <laughs> oh Velcro. There's sort of Smurf age rules because Alf is what like 285 on the live action show. So here he's just it is it is late 100s. That makes for a laugh. No, nope. ah! we can all <laughs> know what I mean. And he wears a Hawaiian shirt. Um, Doesn't everybody when they move to cartoons? Beautiful animation. It's really defined crumminess with some of the worst timing I've seen so far on this lineup. The timing on this show is brutal. The comedic timing. Hey, guys. Whoa, I guess you're busy. It's, 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 it seems like a decent frame rate. The episode I watched was called The Slugs of Wrath. The Shumways move to a slug farm that looks like that duty. And the yokels worship a giant turnip in this kind of cult and force the mom and dad some way into clown outfits and strap them to hammering machines and chant touch bottom soil <laughs> don't worry everything worked out great what is the <laughs> message there <laughs> This show is all about, like, you know how you go to the DMV? Well, here you go to the Pickle House. <laughs> <laughs> you might find it really funny. It's hard to get on DVD, but it's on Hulu Plus. It's online. You can find it. Too. I was really into the live action Alf, so I remember trying to get into this show and just. It just was a different tone altogether. It's the same with the Transformers, you know. And when they're on their home planet, you're just like, what is my stake in this? You yeah, know? I mean, if they were hinting at there was some sort of background plot where you were like, oh man, that's a real countdown to this planet's destruction. That'd yeah, be a reason yeah. to watch, sort of like dinosaurs hinting. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah. The satire's more apt on dinosaurs, where on Alpha it's just Mad Libs. Was it? Was this planet still around on the live action show? No, no, it, it had blown up. up. Oh, he always would joke about it being because they plugged in all the hair dryers. But it right, oh, that's right, nu- that's right, nuclear obl- obliteration. See, I like that better. We all died. But you're right. If they had, if they had kind of moved towards that, like dinosaurs, we'd still be talking about it. <laughs> when you put your hand in a pile of goo. <laughs> so the second half of this would be Alf Tales. Let's watch. <sighs> Let's see what the opening of that's like. Oh, it's like Fantasia. Because what does Alf do, right? He's an actor, see? Except he'd eat Wishbone. The bumpers in between the Alf tails, they're like backstage, and they're like putting up props or whatever. So it's like a stage play thing. Do we ever see any human beings? No. It appears to just be Melmachian's other alien species and maybe animals. No people, though. (laughs) And therein lies the problem. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I don't mean to sound like a xenophobe, but why am I supposed to to care about Al's fucking friends? This is not good, fellas. Where's my stake in this? Yeah, if, if Alf on its own gives you no stakes, then this is like, well, what if those characters you don't care about put on a play? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Here's what I wrote. A spinoff for no one. <laughs> Alf yeah, narrates yeah. and is playing a character in a classic story. But here's the twist. Everything is given. This is, this is what I assume the joke is every episode. Everything is given 80s reality checks. Where it's all big business and insurance jokes and bureaucracy, public official jokes. I watched the Sleepy Hollow episode. That's a good choice. It looked like uh, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. I swear they were referencing it. He was just in a mountain of paperwork. Alf's Ichabod Crane, a photographer. In 88, they might have been, Adam. Uh, He's got a mean boss who wants pictures of the local ghost. (laughs) 
Parker. <laughs> and then Rhonda plays the his girlfriend uh, plays the hot secretary whose nickname for him is Icky, and he goes Icky. That got a laugh out of me. He gives her a boner growl. He goes rawr, rawr. the horse looks like Raggedy Ann's blue camel, and instead of the Sleepy Hollow Bridge, it was the Brooklyn Bridge. Can you believe it? So this the, the theme is New York New York stage play. Then they pan. This makes no sense. Then they pan over to the Statue of Liberty who has no head and is holding up a pumpkin. What am I watching? Do you remember when I was ranting about the subliminal message in Alf? Do you remember what it was? It was the Statue of Liberty. They had stuck it in a shot. Two ships collide and there's an explosion. And then if you freeze frame, there's the Statue of Liberty in like a flag. At the very least, they got the planet thing going for them. Mm-hmm. Right? That's something. Right? I, I thought the planet looked really interesting. Oh, the characters just suck. We have no reason to care about his we friends. We have better writers than this on Gummy Bear. There's no steak. Pass the ketchup. Ha! I know who this show's for, Adam. <laughs> People that like to hear Alf say ha. I don't recommend Alf. I'd recommend Alf the animated <clears throat> series before Alf Tales. It makes no sense. This show makes no sense. It was uh, it was like they threw darts at a board, you know, and trying to save Alf. Finally a contemporary take on consumerism. <laughs> <laughs> don't watch Alf Tales. <laughs> All right, it's 11 o'clock. Time to get high. Pitched! It's been a while. We're We're back back with style. This is season six of the Alvin and the Chipmunks. Now just called the Chipmunks. New animation company. Now Deke is running the show. Ruby Spears is out. We'll give you our all. Yeah, it's, it's, it all sounds like an ad in the background. The female chipmunks are featured highly in this. There's more Miss Miller. Oh, Dave's so tired. He can't do this anymore. <laughs> and kind of this kind of looks like the opening to entertainment tonight. Uh, this was the second time the chipmunks' opening credits changed. Uh, I picked a bad one to start with, though. I watched Alvin's analysis. What's so, that? So I was like, ooh, Alvin in therapy. And then his therapist is like a really lazy Zelda Rubenstein parody called Ruda Weisenheimer. Alvin, uh, a lot of the chipmunk stuff is a little too close to reality. (laughs) Alvin says he's a victim, and then it turns into a clip show. Boo! Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) But but they do remember my favorite episode from an earlier season, Every Chipmunk Tells a Story. I don't know if that counts, Adam. (laughs) I watched Vinny's Visit, the one where their mother visits. She's only appeared in one other episode. She's a weirdo. Like, she's just like, Don't forget to rub your head in the dirt before we eat dinner. <laughs> she doesn't understand the niceties. She's always like, Oh, my little ones. At one point, she comes in Dave's room at night, and I'm like, Is she going to have sex with Dave? Well, I guess you're in charge now. She throws an animal party and tries to write really bad songs for the band that is just animal sounds. I wish they had had a kid, and it was like, <laughs> Oh my God, they have a hybrid? <laughs> They're Andy Keaton. Oh my know? God. <laughs> Dave and her get into a fight because Dave's like, who asked for your opinion? She tries to modernize and David tries to go natural. This, the grass is always greener when the chipmunks don't shit all over it. <laughs> um, other episodes this season, they try to stop treasure thieves with tribal chipmunks in Mexico. There's a parody of Charlie's Angels just in time, an episode where they bring down the Berlin Wall. Whoa, really? <laughs> This this blows my mind, Adam. You thought who was the audience before, right? I watched the Moonlighting parody, Dreamlighting. Oh wow! Because why? Was it all a dream? Um, no. In the beginning, they're watching TV, and Dreamlighting comes on. Who's and, and who's then, the fan of it? Yeah, who's like, I love this show, like Theodore or Jeanette. <laughs> I really enjoy this, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Shepherd sure is hot, babe. They enter the roles of the characters on Moonlighting. They have uh, Theodore's girlfriend is Miss DePesto. Jeanette. And she, Eleanor. Remember I told you I'd get them confused with the facts as life girls. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got one of them to represent a booger. I, I, I guess it was like Theodore, I think. Oh, wow. And then, then they just reprise all the jokes. like Miss. They, really? Yeah, yeah. Like somebody calls in and you recall that Miss DePesto used to make a rhyme every okay. time somebody called. Welcome to Dreamlining Inc. Where we see a clue and you'll think, babe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and she's Stay like, hey, there. Man. All it is is a Mad Magazine parody. Wasn't Moonlighting is racy for television at that time, wasn't it? Yeah. This is season six, volume two of this shit. 
Were the, you think they were counting on the fact that kids had seen moonlighting, or you think they're counting on the fact that adults were watching the Chipmunks? I I had no idea what moonlighting <laughs> was when I was eight. They do a Breakfast Club parody this season too. I wouldn't have gotten that. This is hot. This is experimental. What is in the water in 1988? Uh, <laughs> you know what's not available? Alvin and the Chipmunks. It's really hard to find episodes. Watch it over <laughs> Alf Tales. <laughs> It's 11, 11.30 on the hour. It's not on the hour. It's uh, the completely mental misadventures of Ed Grimley. Oh, yeah. If you'd like the chance to win a free trip to Hollywood, then you best enter the Ed Grimley lookalike contest, I must say. Just watch me show Saturday mornings on NBC for all the details. Based on a SCTV sketch, Adam? That transitioned over to Saturday Night Live. Gets his own cartoon. I guess because... Pee Wee got a show, and Ernest got a show. Ed Grimley's kind of another embodied nerd character. A favorite cartoon of uh, elderly friars on acid. <laughs> <laughs> it's Martin Short as Ed Grimley, Catherine O'Hara, Joe Flaherty as Count Floyd, Andrea Martin as well. Good cast. It's all the SCTV people, Eugene Levy and Dave Thomas make cameos. Christopher Guest. I must speak with you and it's an emergency. Okay. First of all, any news on my audition? No. Oh, well, okay. Now don't hold your breath. No, I'm fine. Sure. B, do you remember the name of that comic actor who asked me out on a date and I said, no, wait, baby, you are not my T-I-P-E? You mean Mr. Martin Shore? That's the turkey. It's kind of like SCTV in that, like, oh, man, the whole neighborhood's wacky. The animation reminds me of Rocco. I feel like they were actually trying here. Okay, so stylistically, this curtain's all over the place. Ed, Ed looks it's like Tintin. Yeah, he does. He looks like Ten Ten, but like he, there's a rat that lives in the wall that looks like a Big Daddy Roth rat. Sheldon, you know what the others look like to me, Adam? Hmm. Uh, Saturday TV Funhouse characters. Yeah, and the designs are really weird. When Martin Short starts riffing, it's just as if it was a celebrity cameo on. T- you never know who's gonna be on the end of the phone. Well, anyway, the, the character of Irving Cohen shows up. <laughs> Irving Cohen. He's like, I'm gonna sing a terrible song. Meanwhile, Ed's a big fan, so he just dances. Irving Cohen is an old SCTV character. He's sort of a parody of the T for Two author Irving Caesar Whoa. and other Tin Pan Alley. Oh my style. god! Really? <laughs> I'm sorry, I said earlier that they were experimental. <laughs> <laughs> this is an American children's show for elderly Canadians. Are they on the cusp of realizing or thinking that adults are watching these cartoons? And then they also slot in Count Floyd as a as a TV show that they watch. Uh, Count Floyd was a character on SCTV who was in a, a rinky dink oh. horror movie show. He would dress like a vampire and howl like a werewolf because he couldn't remember the difference. <laughs> Here, it's more like he's a cranky UHF style host of a dink show. In front of kids. With a bad. Funny. Yeah, with little countettes booing, little weasels booing it, it's him. It's funny because the guy's not like somebody that just gets along famously with kids. He looks like he's like, just like, ah, yeah. Yeah, it's, ah. a, it's, a, it's a real <laughs> scary show. I'm, I'm terrified and I just made it up. <laughs> ha cha cha. No Bob and Doug McKenzie in here? Boo. It's all about beer. It's too much beer. <laughs> Can you think of any other character that probably could have gotten their own TV show? I know the Coneheads had an animated uh, special. I'm surprised we didn't get a uh, superstar, uh, Molly Shannon. Yeah, I could kind of see that. They could have done that. Wild and Crazy Guys. (laughs) Oh, no, that would have been awful. If it had been the 80s, that would have been. If they had animated them into some sort of Ralph Bashke style. There was a Blues Brothers cartoon, am I correct? I don't know. Ed Grimley, I mean, it's still... it's still good for kids, I think. You know, I, I don't think I don't think uh, Martin Short's really missing his audience here. I believe this was probably also a response to Camp Candy, which also featured wow, SCTV that. characters uh, in Hawaiian enough shirts enough to be like, well, that's the SCTV universe. You can get this all on DVD. Somebody, all thirteen. I liked it better than I remembered. It didn't hurt that it was following Alf Tales. It's all right. <laughs> you could do worse. You could do worse. Speaking of which, it's noon, so we have to watch Two Hit for TV. Oh my God! Two hit for TV. Hey kids, I just found some matches. Pick them up because it says for a good time. See Colin and Amit. <laughs> Why did the kids in the hall intro become a car- uh, show? <laughs> so. This is a show with Colin Quinn and Amit Zappa. What? What? Because nothing says Saturday morning cartoons. Like. And for a good time, see them. Is that accurate? Let's be honest. The cartoons are over at this point because... This is on the schedule. Um, <laughs> this is when Flip is on. 
<laughs> yeah, things get so weird at noon. I'm surprised they're even in the schedule lineup. Yeah. But we got to check them out. Glow here comes on sometime after this or during we saw. Then the Fall Guy reruns. <laughs> we f- uh, we follow a bowling ball to some Clarissa style credits. That looks dangerous though. It's gonna hit that woman. Wow, what? It- Colin oh no! I'm here to bury all the joke. We're as close as brothers. Who's the straight man here? Stargate Atlantis producer. Peter DeLuise. They were like, we got to do something with music. Music videos are big. Put it in a bowling alley. Am I wrong for saying, like, is Colin Quinn all they could get? (laughs) So, wait, this is post remote control, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. but I think remote control is like 85, 86. They ejected him out the at the back at the back wall like they do all the losers. Mm. Yeah. So in this show, they would have musical guests like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Sparks, and Elvez, the Mexican Elvis. Uh, Amit plays it weird. Colin Quinn plays it Colin Quinnally. I take every line and destroy it. Did they still meet at a party or something? So there's sketches. I watched a sketch where Colin Quinn pretends to be a little boy and is beat up by little kids. Hey, you kids, leave me alone. I'm a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know we kids like us kids like to screw around and have a lot of fun, but being bullied's not a cool thing to do. <laughs> ow, hey, ow, oh man, oh you're hurting me. Hey kids, I hope you enjoyed the continued Canadian clownery of Ed Grimley. Now let's safely rock from the confines of my favorite bowling alley. I don't ever wanna feel like I did that day. You've had your fun with the gummy bears. You've made it through an hour of ALF. Congratulations. <laughs> this is your prize. <laughs> Too hip for TV. And it was. Seven episodes. They're like, never mind. They replaced this with uh, reruns of It's Punky Brewster, which went off in 86. Her and her alien. What a bad idea. You can't see me, but I'm shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> SMH. That's how you end on this morning. And then what? High Q. <laughs> this uh, is a weird year for cartoons, man. Oh, man. Well, guys, it's almost the afternoon. I guess we'll NBC. Oh, my God. You next time. We won't CB it. Don't. <laughs> we'll CBS for sure. Yeah, next episode is CBS. All right. Well, I'm Adam Fair. You can see me at Adam Fair Land on YouTube. Yeah, and I'm Dusty Griffin, and you can see me on uh, Instagram at Dusty is Certifiable. All right, enjoy the weekend, everybody. And now, these messages.